Hi everyone, um, my name is Tiffany Tang and I'm the marketing coordinator for BFW High School Publishers. Um, tonight we are presenting on teaching pre-AP English through culturally responsive teaching practices with our fabulous authors Renee Shea, John Golden, and Tracy Schultz. Um, before we begin, um, if you're not familiar with BFW, we are a high school publisher that focuses specifically on AP textbooks. Um, we really pride ourselves on creating um, teacher resources like full annotated teacher's editions and test banks. And we now have a full pre-AP to AP English suite that covers grades 9 through 12. So if you're interested in getting any sample copies or anything like that, feel free to check out our catalog and get in contact with us. Um, some quick housekeeping things about our webinar program go to webinar. Um, first, I'd like to point out that everyone that's attending today is muted. This is just to prevent any background noise or echo throughout the presentation. So if you are experiencing technical difficulties or need to ask an organizer something, there is a chat function in the GoToWebinar um, pop-up panel on your screen. So if you'd like to ask a question, um, again, for technical difficulties or just about the content of the webinar, you can feel free to use the chat function or the question function. Um, we also are rec recording this webinar, so you can review it later on. So don't worry if your internet drops out, we've got you covered. Um, so without further ado, um, I'm going to hand it off to the author so we can begin. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Uh, we're going to start off uh, our night just with uh, some introductions. Uh, Renee? Yes, I'm very glad to be here. I uh, wonder if anybody's here from New Orleans, if any of our participants are there, or if they're all out at Mardi Gras, but it's a festive day. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I've been working on all uh, four of the books, at, uh, the 9 through 12, and uh, I used to be the director of freshman comp at Bowie State University. Now I'm living in Columbus, Ohio, working on these textbooks and also doing some writing for some literary publications on contemporary authors. And I'm Tracy Scholes. I am currently located in the Ailey Independent School District, which is in Houston, Texas. But just recently, as in last night, I was uh, just named the Director of Advanced Academics for the Spring Branch ISD School District, which is also in Houston, Texas. So I'm very glad to be here with everybody, and thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Renee. My name is John Golden. I am an English teacher at Portland Public Schools in Oregon. This year I am uh, working with the central office, working with groups of ninth grade teachers, trying to make sure that all of our students uh, start high school in a positive way, uh, contributing to our graduation rate uh, down the line. So our plan for the night tonight, uh, we're going to start with just defining some terms, how we are working uh, with this term, uh, culturally responsive teaching. We're going to try to set the, the context. Why is this so important? Why is this uh, something um, that we all, as all educators, should be thinking and working with? We're going to talk about some guiding principles that drive our thought and our work with, uh, with culturally responsive teaching. And then we're going to try to connect some of those things to some of the beliefs and structures that are in place in uh, Bedford's pre-AP uh, program. And the last part of our webinar will really focus on trying to identify and describe some of the tools that are in place for the culturally responsive teacher. Again, this is not the idea that somehow anyone can take a book, even these books, and suddenly you are a quote-unquote culturally responsive teacher. This is not sort of how it works. It's really about understanding beliefs and structures and ideas. And, and what, we've, what we're going to share with you tonight are just some tools and processes to make that uh, work a little bit easier on, on your end. And we'll uh, spend some time at the end just wrapping up and definitely having some time for uh, questions and answers. There'll also be times uh, throughout the presentation where we'll just take a quick little pause and we'll allow for Tiffany to look to see if there are any questions that are coming in through the chat uh, that we need to address at that time. So that's kind of our plan for the day uh, today. Some of the resources that we're just going to kind of point you toward that we use to draw on uh, as we're developing some of these materials, and certainly uh, for this presentation here, uh, you'll have access to this PowerPoint afterwards. But uh, I just want to kind of share some of the, the tools and resources that we use. You noticed on our pictures on the previous slide, we're all white educators, which means that we need to 
do a lot of work on our own and a lot of research and a lot of thinking and a lot of listening uh, about how to employ some of these uh, culturally responsive pedagogies into our practice. So we're going to start off with what is culturally responsive teaching really by talking about what it is not. And Renee is going to start us off with this. Well, let me just say that when we began to do some um, significant planning for our uh, webinar here, uh, it was the beginning of Black History Month. So that is in and of itself probably something we could, we could um, get into a conversation about in terms of culturally responsive teaching. But Barnes & Noble um, did us a favor by giving us a, a way to start this conversation, perhaps. And that is that they, in an effort, uh, uh, misguided as it turned out, but in an effort to be culturally responsive and to show their commitment to diversity and to um, particularly black writers at this point, they had this idea of redesigning covers. And so um, I believe Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz was going to be Asian and uh, Frankenstein is black and, uh, you know, you can see Moby Dick and the like. Um, this did not that well. Uh, as soon as the idea hit the press, uh, we began to get some feedback, shall we say, and pushback. Um, and people weighed in, such as Angie Thomas, as, as we know, the, the author of The Hate You Give. And she said, or here's a thought, promote books by authors of color. Um, and that, that was her tweet. And um, then they were also, Barnes & Noble was also planning to have a, a presentation at their Fifth Avenue, our panel discussion at their Fifth Avenue store in New York, a flagship. And he said, well, what I was going to do is talk about the history of black voices, the importance of black voices in literature, of not changing the cover, but changing the content, changing the way that we think about a classic. What is a classic, classic to whom, and um, basically interrogating the canon. So I guess our first point is that this kind of artificial um, way of, of saying, oh, well, we, we're being culturally responsive because we are including uh, authors, characters of color are showing that it doesn't matter in a way, um, which is a violation of the whole concept of, of cultural responsiveness. Um, it is not outside the realm of possibility. There are still those who are thinking that way. So this is what we're not going to do. This is not what we're, this is what we're trying to avoid. And continuing in that vein of what we're going to avoid, and I think that we're uh, particularly um, aware of it in terms of uh, this month being Black History Month, that somehow cultural responsive teaching is just about uh, units of diversity, multicultural units. Uh, it's February, so let's bring out our Langston Hughes, for instance. And I think that for a long time, that was sort of one school district's or, or um, uh, teacher's response to being culturally responsive teaching was to just to point to multicultural units that they might be doing. Worse, I think, too, is that a, a whole lot of um, uh, companies and publishers, in some cases, bought into this notion that somehow cultural response was just about some strategies. And if we could just put some strategies out there, plug and play in that way, now suddenly our teachers will automatically be culturally responsive. Um, another misconception of, of uh, cultural responsive teaching. Zerda so Hammond also continues that it's not about just having things that are about engagement. And she points to you know, uh, teachers leading call and response chants about exponents or rapping about the Boston Tea Party. It's not about just engaging. And I think that's the one of the mistakes that gets made as well and the uh, sort of misconceptions. But rather, and this is Zaretta Hammond's definition, that it's really about building the learning capacity of the individual student and leveraging the affective and cognitive scaffolding that students already bring with them uh, from outside the schooling context. So for our work and for our sort of thinking about this is that we have to make sure that we recognize that we are teaching all students, not just one particular group, one particular level, but all students. And that means we need to be responsive to all of their needs. And that's going to be one of the themes that we're going to go through in our webinar here. In my district in Portland, we've also started to go beyond this definition of cultural responsive, and we're starting to use the, the term culturally sustaining. And the idea of culturally sustaining pedagogy is about developing and maintaining 
students' own cultural com competence, and recognizing that oftentimes communities who have been and continue to be damaged and erased through schooling, we need to make sure we are sustaining. So recognizing that as students bring their own cultures and backgrounds and, and ways of learning and thinking into the classroom, that we are not discarding them or disregarding them in, way, in any kind of way, but to make sure that their cultures and ours are, all of ours are being able to be sustained as they come into a context like school. And this is going to be sort of our, our last uh, sort of thinking about uh, some of the defining or, or, or defining terms of cultural uh, responsive teaching. This really comes from uh, ad adapted by the work of uh, Ladson Billings. And, and uh, Barbara Esquerdo talks a little bit about the idea of cultural competence, how it plays out, especially in a language arts classroom, is about full being full of mirrors and windows that students should see themselves reflected in the classrooms, their own cultures, their own backgrounds, and have opportunities to learn more and see into the lived experiences of others, windows. So this notion that a, a culture responsive classroom is one that is filled with windows and mirrors. This might be just a, a quick little time for us to pause and, and Tiffany, just to see if there are any questions that have come up in the chat or other words um, regarding anything that we've presented so far. Um, I'm not seeing any questions, so again, if you're attending, feel free to send them over in the questions or the chat function, but otherwise, I think we're good for now. Okay, fantastic. So we're going to move into uh, addressing this question, why do we need culturally responsive or culturally sustaining teaching? I'm going to uh, pass this over to uh, Tracy. Yeah, and so uh, we know as English teachers in the English classroom every year, we know that um, we, there are gaps that need to be closed. And uh, that is no more telling than in the AP exam results that we see year after year. You can see on your screen there that it kind of runs across, you know, that school and the way it's taught now really speaks to maybe a couple of the groups, but not all the groups. And so knowing that we have diversity in our classrooms, and we're getting more and more diverse um, with each passing year, uh, especially in ALEAF ISD, we have a, a lot of diversity. Uh, we have 108 languages represented. And even though scores may suffer a little bit because we have language learners in the classroom and whatnot, the truth is, is that we know that we're falling short of uh, addressing the needs of all of our students in the classroom. And so if we go to the next slide. Could uh, we just wait one second on that slide, please, Tracy? Sure, um, sure. I could, I would, yeah, I would just like to say that one of the things we didn't highlight here, but it's really important to look at, I think, is how many scores are above the three, you know, are a three or above. Because that's where the students start to get some kind of credit, some kind of acknowledgement. And, and it, it's not, it, I mean, there's a very, such a very clear trend here. But that's also, I think, why the College Board and why, you know, we talk a lot about the pre-AP. And pre-AP means really AP preparation, not, not, a, not necessarily um, um, a way to um, isolate kids, but a way to exclude them, but quite the contrary, a way to bring them in. And I know we're going to talk some more about that. But I just want to point out that the Scores of three and above, I mean, it's, it's a, a marked trend and not something that, uh, that uh, not something we want to continue or sustain. Right, and, and you also make a good point in that in Texas, the AP exam scores are actually tied to our college career military readiness accountability uh, uh, reports that we have to turn into the state each year. And so uh, it's very important that we help students be successful on those AP exams, like you said, Renee, in getting the score point three or above. And then if we look at it, you know, when you have the, when you address uh, culturally responsive teaching in the classroom, Christopher Emden, Emden says that you improve the rigor in the classroom. Um, and like uh, John said earlier, that we can't assume that a few strategies or, or things that work in a, a, you know, teaching approaches and protocols and whatnot that work with a particular group of students is transferable to all groups of students. And um, it doesn't always transfer. And I love the whole notion of the windows in mirrors because Emden states specifically that we get students 
if we're reflective on the relationships that those students have with their schools and teachers in the classroom, that is looking through those windows uh, it's to see the lived experiences of others and seeing ourselves in the mirror so that we know ourselves, those relationships do in fact strengthen um, with emotional maturity and the understanding of ourself and the affirmation of the identities of others. And that, in turn, is what's going to influence the rigor in the classroom. Renee? Hey, I, 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 yeah, I want to talk a little bit about, and pick up on a couple points that have already been made. Um, and one thing we haven't talked about so far, and we might have a conversation about, about this as we move on, um, <clears throat> with the participants, and that is, what are we talking about when we're talking about culturally responsive, uh, responsive teaching? Because culture is such a, a broad term, and I think most of the time, as we saw with Barnes and Noble, and not that they use culturally responsive in their in their any of their marketing, our um, our PR materials, but the notion that culture is it's, it's race. Our culture is. Um, and very often, not often is it gender, but it, that, that is one cultural definition. But culture is race or ethnicity or religion. Another thing that I think those AP, AP scores are, are showing us is that culture is also first generation college. And, you know, that's, that is a, um, such a powerful issue for so many of us. I think both where John's working, where Tracy, and many of the students Tracy has worked with, and I don't know as much about her new district, but I imagine it, it's similar. Um, when we're asking and expanding um, the uh, students' access to AP courses, we're often bringing in students who are from first generation college. I'm first generation college, and I worked with students most of my life who were. So I understand that that is a, a culture in and of itself. And one of the things that we talked about, um, one of the quotes was leveraging what students bring with them, because part of what you're doing in your classroom is validating that culture in whatever ways you can. And if you're part of the culture, that's one thing. If you're not, you have to find other ways to do it. We obviously do that in different ways. Um, but I just wanted to bring that up as that, as that concept of, of culture. And also to put in a little uh, plug here that if you've never read Snapping Beans uh, by Lisa Parker, it's a really powerful poem about, about that experience of a young woman coming home and, and trying to connect or reconnect with her grandmother. Now, the danger of a single story is, of course, part of this, because the single story that many of us who are so committed to education even unconsciously teach is that this, this culture of education is, is the superior culture. Um, and part of that comes through with the canon. Part of it comes through with our, our own sense of, of people who are educated. But I have a, an anecdote here. I have a, a story, a single story here that, that will um, move into several stories. That a colleague of mine told me that her school was concerned that there, that there was uh, uh, too much homogeneity in approach to curriculum and uh, the, um, just in general, that the students themselves were uh, pretty homogeneous in the school and that they wanted to do some, something that was culturally responsive. Very um, noble uh, intention. And they hired a consultant. Um, and the consultant began by asking them to watch Chimamanda Adichie's uh, TED Talk, The Danger of a Single Story. I'm sure many of you have seen that and, and are probably as fond of it as, as I am. And my colleague said to me, everyone sort of sighed and thought, well, we have seen this before. But at the end of it, the consultant said, now, what I'd like to have you do is to go back into your groups, whether it's a professional learning community or a department or however your your school is organized, go back into your groups and ask yourself, what is the story you're telling? What is the story you're telling by the materials you're, you're teaching and privileging, by the relationships that you have with your students? And just in general, are you telling a single story? If so, what is that? Are you telling more than one story? Should you be? And she said it was just incredibly powerful because as they went through, and she was really looking from the middle school on through, through high school, and she said just the, the kinds of things that they noticed by beginning with that self-examination were very um, uh, telling and powerful and enabled them to start thinking about 
changes they might make. And I was thinking about that, too, as John was talking about sustaining. So it wasn't just a matter of saying, okay, we're going to change this, we're going to add this. But, no, how are we going to fundamentally recraft how we frame what we're doing, and then how are we going to check on that? And, again, I hope you can, if you haven't seen this, by all means, take a look at it. We're not going to watch it now. Um, and um, Or maybe just have a look at it and think about how my colleague approached it after she'd seen it several times. And I think I've, I've actually mentioned this already. I think Tracy has some comments on this. But this is these are just stories, our questions, I think, that we can ask ourselves and, uh, and start that conversation with our, with our colleagues. Yeah, and I love the whole idea of the, that danger of the single story and that kind of um, um, linear perspective that we sometimes get trapped in in the classroom uh, in discussions or when we're looking at a, a subject or idea or concept. Uh, and it's yeah, and I really like the question: whose stories are we not telling? That omission or that silencing, you know, of the alternative points of view. Um, that can be told from different perspectives. So, definitely, definitely don't want to get limited with the with the single story classroom. Uh, and really, to further emphasize, um, oh, did we want to pause for questions? Nope, I think we're good. Okay, okay. Um, and so, what are some of the essential beliefs of a teacher practicing culturally responsive and sustaining pedagogy in the classroom? Well, back to Emden again. He. Um, he published in the, the September 2016 ASCD publication of uh, Educational Leadership Magazine. He published something called the Seven C's for Effective Teaching. And again, going back to that relational teaching uh, is that building those strong relationships with students uh, paves the way to academic rigor. And he, he kind of uh, surmised it into seven uh, strategies, if you will, and even though we're not saying, you know, strategies in and of themselves are a fix-all solution, what I like about his approach is that it does focus on uh, incorporating the student more in dialogue in the classroom and more in the learning experience so that it's not just teacher to student. Uh, now, there are seven, but the only three that we're going to really focus on are the co-teaching, the context, and the content. But all of them can be found in that educational leadership um, uh, edition. So what is co-teaching? Co-teaching is where students are part of the teaching process. And that is that it becomes a learning partnership and not just a monopoly. And I love this because it tells it tells your students that they are their value added in the classroom. They bring value to the ideas and concepts and discussions and texts in the classroom. And it's up to the teacher to be able to make those connections between the gifts that our students possess and the content that's being taught. Uh, whether that's uh, physics and skateboarding, if, if you've got a, a, a student that loves to skateboard, how are they going to see themselves in the stories and the texts? that they read in the classroom. We want to be able to make room in the classroom for the artist, for the activist, for the athlete. Uh, we want to make room in the classroom for those multiple perspectives we've touched on, the multiple cultures, the multiple languages. And I love the way Renee defined culture, not just race, but gender and uh, situational. Um, and so co-teaching does take that idea that there's equal value in one another. That's what makes it powerful. When students are co-teachers in the classroom, that brings a level of rigor and a level of uh, engagement that otherwise might not be there. And then the next C that Imjin talks about um, is context that we're going to focus on. And context is a way of it not just bringing the community into the classroom, but going out into the community. And the way Endon describes this is that it, it, it's sort of a reciprocal relationship between the classroom and the community. And that when you have a greater understanding of where your students are from, and you've immersed yourself in the experiences that they have lived, it strengthens that bond the average in the classroom. Did somebody say something? My phone cut out. 
Nope, I don't think so, Tracy. Are we good? Okay, I'm sorry. I heard my phone cut out. I wanted to make sure y'all y'all can still hear me. Um, and so Emden also talks about how natural relationships with students uh, can be limited because of a teacher's unfamiliarity with a, a student's culture or their lived experiences. And he encourages uh, educators to get involved, to get involved with the community. Um, I know that we, uh, ALEAF ISD, has many partnerships with uh, businesses and, and um, uh, community leaders, and we have actually sought their help on a lot of the initiatives that we have tried to move forward with in our district. We sought the help of the um, Chinese community when we wanted to open our international school and our uh, Mandarin Chinese program. We've got a lot of collaborative partnerships with businesses that you know, that we we use to buy goods and, and T-shirts and, and, you know, the breakfast shop, which is locally owned and the students go to our school. We do business with our community, and we go out and we talk to them. We get invited to the International Parade Day, so we get involved there. And then again, it's not just immersing yourself in the community and the experiences that your students live every day, but it's bringing those into the classroom and that value-added piece, showing that where they live and, and what they experience matters in the classroom. And then the next one Tracy, that we're going to talk about, yes, I'm sorry? No, I was just going to say something about that context. I thought Emden is very powerful when he says, you need to find out who the leaders are in the community, and if you, especially if you're not a member of that, commun that particular mm -hmm. community. How do you do that and bring them into the class? And I, I remember an experience I had when I had worked really, really hard preparing all sorts of materials for a, 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 an, a freshman comp class about the Vietnam conflict and what had happened. And the students are sort of slumping there and being, you know, completely bored. And I, I, I asked why. And uh, they said, because it's not our war. I mean, we don't know about it. It doesn't, you know, it's over. And what's the point? And we started to talk. And one of the um, students in the class said he had a guy he worked with who had been to Vietnam. He said, he didn't like to talk about it much, but, but he was in the war. And I said, well, why don't you ask him if he can, if he'd want to talk about it here. And the, so the student initiated it. The man came into class and, and, you know, it really was a lovely, it was a really positive experience in that they mm -hmm. were interested in, in their own reading. And that also taught me a lot. They wanted to decide where it was that they were going to go and do their readings to explore this particular ex historical experience. So I, yes. you know, I, I, mm -hmm. sometimes it's frustrating because you're not part of the community, but I think this really, um, Emden really leads, um, has some very good advice. All okay. right. Thank you, Renee. And then uh, the third one we were going to talk about briefly was uh, content, the content of the classroom. And I know that with context and content, we, we shift from, uh, in our classrooms, just focusing so much on the what uh, to kind of reshifting our focus to the who. So it's not just what we're teaching, but it's who we're teaching. And in this sense, the content, the way Emden describes it, is it's, it's not uh, just the, now it's not just the what you're teaching, but it's the how we learn. And the notion that the teacher solving problems with the students is a very powerful, uh, not just a relationship builder, but um, it's a powerful learning experience to know that the teacher may or may not have all the answers. And when we can model to our students that we, too, are learners and this is how it's done and this is how we grapple with ideas and concepts um, and that I may not know all the answers, but we know how to work together to, to find them, that inquisitiveness uh, is powerful. Uh, I've often said that you automatically build in rigor when you stoke the fires of curiosity. And there's no better way to be curious than with students. You can explore topics and issues and discussions with them because it does give you that opportunity to build that relational capacity uh, in the classroom. So again, uh, another of the, the seven C's that Emden says are great strategies to use in the classroom to build rigor through that relational capacity. Great. Thank you, Tracy. And I, I think this might be a good time for us to pause because the, the last half of this webinar is going to be to try to sort of make the connection between some of this 
uh, foundations we've been describing about cultural responsive and cultural sustaining pedagogy with uh, the ways we try to sort of embed that within the, the materials that we're going to discuss. So this might be a good time for us uh, just to see if there are any other questions, Tiffany, that have come up. Uh, no, it looks like you guys did a great job explaining. There are no questions right now. So that's a really positive spin to put on that, Tiffany, that uh, we're doing such a great job that there are no questions, or there's just <laughs> no kind of questions at all. We'll go with the positive side. So we're going to uh, kind of spend a little bit of time thinking about how these principles that we've just described sort of are embedded within some of the resources and the, the materials that we've been developing here. And the two books that we're going to be talking about are uh, what Renee described earlier as pre-AP. And I think that it's important um, for us to think about what we mean by pre-AP. And, and I want to I want to bring it here to the College Board's equity and access policy. I think that there is this sense that somehow pre-AP is a synonym maybe for an honors class or a separate group of kids that we are preparing and cultivating to be successful in an AP class. And I just want to um, sort of state here, and then we'll, you'll hear it throughout, that is absolutely not the uh, ideas that we have at all. Uh, we believe that pre-AP simply mean what happens before they go into an AP class. And there are a whole lot of things that have to happen before students going into an AP class. It's, it's one thing just to say, hey, we're going to open up the doors and, and anyone can come into an AP class because we want to make sure that we're being equitable for, for all. And that's great, but that misses a really important thing that absolutely has to happen prior, that students need to have access to academically challenging coursework before they enroll in those AP classes, which prepares them for AP success. It's only through a commitment to equitable preparation and access that true equity and excellence can be achieved. So we believe really that equity is about equity of preparation and that we support and challenge all students through some of these materials that we're going to describe to you. So when they walk into those AP classes one or two years after um, they're working in the ninth and 10th grade, that they can absolutely have that earned competence to be successful in either one of those English classes, uh, those AP classes into college and into the future. Renee, do you want to add to that or and or do you want to talk a little bit about the sort of end in mind that we have here for these books? No, you know, I think you, you did you, you said it exactly right that we really are kind of working against that notion of a, a select group of students who have already been selected to go into to AP. Um, and, and I would also um, say that I think we have to acknowledge here that some of what we're talking about is is a challenge in the day-to-day -day life of the classroom where there are standardized tests and where um, students and teachers are held accountable to these external standards. And the way that those can mesh with culturally responsive practices, I think, is is, is truly the challenge here. Uh, I like very much what Tracy had to say, which is that rigor comes out of curiosity. Curiosity rarely comes out of rigor, <laughs> um, if, if rigor is defined as coercion. Um, and I, I just did a, a piece on an Albert Einstein um, commencement address where he said there are different ways to motivate people. Two, two of them absolutely don't work. One is coercion, and the other is ambition. Um, to, to encourage competition. Um, and the third one is intrinsic interest. And part of what we're talking, a good part of what we're talking about tonight is ways to generate that intrinsic interest and to nurture it. So I think we have to acknowledge how, the difficulty of doing that. Once it starts to work, and I think Tracy and John have certainly seen it work in their district, it, it really is magic. But in the meantime, we have the end in mind here, which are two AP courses. But, you know, please note here that we've said courses, not exams. Not to minimize the importance of the exams, but an AP course still allows, even with the new frameworks and the like, where there are very specific skills that, that students are um, um, 
working with and that teachers are assessing um, in order to, to bring them along. Um, but even so, the course allows a great deal of flexibility. Now, AP Language and Comp, uh, most of you probably know this, so I'm not going to read them, but we're talking about a very large skill, becoming skilled readers of prose written in a variety of rhetorical contexts and skilled writers who compose for a variety of purposes. The AP Language course, which is one of my all-time favorites, experiences having worked with teachers in that environment and worked on the development committee and the like, it seems to me that it, it, it invites students into current events, it invites students into critical thinking, civil discourse, everything that's going on right now. And that synthesis question it brings in lots of research. So there are many opportunities there in the course for culturally responsive practices. At the same time, that you're preparing students to take an exam where they have to demonstrate their, where their performance will demonstrate their uh, mastery of the writing of arguments, the use of sources, and an understanding of historical principles. The literature and composition course, again, basically I, I, can, I can read all of this and tell you what it's supposed to do, but what it's mainly supposed to do is help students become lifelong readers, to give them the skills so they are more appreciative readers, uh, critical readers, yes, but also appreciative readers of poetry and of, um, of, of uh, fiction and of drama. And again, I think this one is often a challenge to us because it, we don't know in college there aren't as many requirements for literature and composition. And yet we hear over and over again about the empathy that uh, students gain by reading these things. So the test itself is going to ask them to analyze prose, analyze a poem, and talk about a thematic issue in a uh, longer work of literature. But how you get students there will depend very much upon your students and the, the community that they're, the culture that they're a part of, or the cultures, I should say. Um, I'll also um, make a plug here for another um, uh, volume of educational leadership, um, a current one, with Carol Jago's article in there about um, how literature, teaching literature, or engaging students with literature also teaches empathy. Uh, as you all know, Carol is a, a, an advocate, um, and probably <laughs> more than an advocate of the reading of literature. And that one's a very nice piece. And Renee, so may, I, may I add a little piece here, too? <clears throat> Absolutely. I, I, I really love that you you emphasize the word courses and, and not exams, and I'll tell you why. I was recently asked um, by a principal of an IB school, what, what would happen if advanced academics and AP went completely away? Um, what would you do? And my response was, it doesn't matter what you call the course, there is a set there is a set skill set, that critical reading, that civil discourse, all of those skills that you brought up that are addressed are critical for any learner in any classroom. And it, 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 call it what you will, but the preparation and the skill sets that are necessarily to be successful in college and beyond uh, with all those critical strategies, the critical reading, the, the writing, the uh, the an analyzing, the synthesis, that is something every student should be able to know and, and do. And so I, I just wanted to say I appreciate you focusing in on that it's course and skills and not tests. Well, I've got a personal testimony here because my oldest grandson is a freshman in college this year and uh, he's nearby at, at Denison and he said, um, that I asked him if an AP language class was really helpful to him in, in, in high school. And I, you know, he knew the answer I wanted, so he was trying. But he said, in freshman comp, yeah, but he said it was really helpful in his political theory and his philosophy courses. So, or no, it wasn't philosophy, I think it was ethics. So he said that that argument, that ability to look at both sides, all of that was there. And that's actually what Tracy's talking about, I think, when you talk about career, military, and college preparation, that the students feel confident that they can manage these new environments because they have the skills, even though it's not the English skill in the English class only, and et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think, um, I, I hope that's happening. 
Mm -hmm. I think that what uh, both Tracy and Renee have been talking about here is that there are these skills that we can identify and classify. And in our sort of world that we're talking about now in a pre-AP space, there are certain things that are absolutely overlapping that we can teach in a ninth and 10th grade classroom that absolutely prepare the students for either and both of these courses. And at the same time, also recognizing in this, this Venn diagram here that there are some things that are just very unique to ninth and 10th graders. For those of you who, who teach freshmen or sophomores, you know that. <laughs> And so part of our approach and our philosophy uh, for these books is to recognize that uh, in this pre-AP space, we need to do both. And I think that one of the key things that we've identified, too, is that to be a culturally responsive teacher is about choice. And I think that this is a, the central conflict and dynamic that I think that American education is facing right now. At the same time, we're trying to have much tighter curriculum, tighter control over what happens in the classroom for valid and great reasons. At the same time, we're also recognizing that, as we've been saying all night tonight, a culturally responsive teacher is a teacher who is making choices based upon the unique students who are sitting right in front of them. So this idea of teacher choice is deeply embedded in the work that we've tried to create here for these books, which is that no one knows your student better than you. I'm in Portland, Tracy's in Texas, and Renee's in Ohio, and the publisher's in New York. There's no way that we know what your students are and what they need. But what we did try to do is to recognize that there are a lot of choices that you're going to make to be a culturally responsive teacher. And working closely with the student, which we'll get into a little bit further, you have to be able to be able, encouraged, and supported to make those appropriate curricular choices. So the next part of this webinar is really going to be about the ways that we've tried to embed these choices that you can make to be responsive to your own student needs. And because, as Tracy pointed out in reviewing the Emden work, is that the student voice is an essential voice. And unfortunately, it's a voice that's often shut out of the, the curricular conversations. So we also believe very strongly in student choice. And building on some of the motivational work, uh, motivational research that Mike Anderson has done, is that students know their own abilities better than we do. And they absolutely, and I, I, am, I am committed to this as a, as a truth, is that students want to be engaged in appropriately challenging work. That myth that somehow students just want to get by, give them what's easy, and let me go on, is not true in my opinion at all. So students actually will self-differentiate when the conditions are right, when they are partners, when they see themselves, as Emden said, um, as part of a, an ownership and a relationship in the classroom, when students can feel like they can take risks, when they can challenge themselves without penalty or fear. We'll have those opportunities. So we've tried to embed both teacher and student choice into these materials. The, the last part of this webinar is going to focus really on three things that we tried to build in here. Text variety, essential questions, and speaking listening opportunities. And Renee, I know you'd like to try to draw a connection between these features and these materials and some of the things we talked about earlier with cultural responsive teaching. Yeah, I'm going to try, but this is, you know, again, help me out here. Part of this, part of what John has just been talking about and Tracy's been discussing here is that the materials that we have put forward we're hoping are absolutely helpful in all sorts of ways but that they also launch and the launch is the part that we can't do and no textbook can do um, and that is that you that because as John was just saying you know your own students better than anyone else but these are the things we tried to do that would unify the materials that are in there and that would also launch. So there's a text variety and by variety there's diversity of voice. There really is. And the College Board has really embraced this as well with their their uh, percentages of, of what will appear on the exams in terms of 20th century, 21st, uh, women versus men, various definitions of diversity. But also text variety in terms of complexity, difficulty, and also context is very much taken into account when we talk about variety. And we're going to get very specific about each of these. 
But then we also have these essential questions, which are really big questions. I, I think Tracy and I agree wholeheartedly with, with John and anybody who works on any of these books does. We believe that kids want to be engaged. They are not, you know, the, oh, kids don't care, they don't read, they, don't, they just want to be on their phone. We just, we, we, well, they do want to be on their phone, I'll admit that. <laughs> but they, we really do believe that they want to be engaged, but they don't necessarily understand why they should be engaged with the concept of a rhetorical strategy. They have to be engaged with some essential questions about the role of the, the citizen in, in dialogue or something bigger or whether the United States has ever um, dealt with their racial challenges. Those are big questions that the concepts and the skills can be built into answering the questions or addressing the questions, you probably never answer them. And then speaking, listening, and collaborative discussion goes right back to all the people we've been talking about, Emden and Hammond in particular, that if, you're, if you don't have people who, if you're not developing in your students the relationship that allows them to, or that assures them, that gives them the confidence that they have their own voice and that that voice is as valued as your voice is, then they're not going to be engaged. So we really try to make sure we have both topics, questions, text, all of those things that will generate that kind of speaking, listening, and collaborative environment in the classroom. So John and Tracy are now going to talk about specific things that uh, are available and are developed in the books to do that. Great. Thank you, Renee. And as Renee just spoke, text variety, we think about text level, text type, text topic, and different text responses. And we're just going to show you just some brief samples just to kind of give you an idea of, of sort of what we mean by each of these. Text level is really about trying to match the text with the student level of where the students are. Uh, and again, because we believe so much that all students are pre-AP if they're in ninth and 10th grade, we're going to have a wide variety of students in our classrooms. And here's just a screenshot of two chapters from the ninth grade book that might be too small or even too blurry for you to see, but I'll just sort of briefly sort of describe it, is that the way that these are set up is that each one of these chapters uh, focuses on a particular uh, rhetorical mode or, or type. So, for instance, the argument. The texts that are found within section one are texts that students can engage with with really limited background, limited context, uh, the lexile tends to be pretty, uh, uh, pretty, you know, lower at the low end of a ninth grade level. The idea is that these are, are texts that students can probably engage with on their own um, or with minimal support. Texts in section two are really texts that we want students to be at at the grade level uh, here in grade nine. And these are texts that are a little longer, a little bit more complex. Uh, these are texts that might require and need a little bit more background context, more teacher support. And then skipping down to the bottom, you'll see text section three. These are texts recognizing the fact that some of our students who are in our pre-AP classes, they're ready to go. They are ready for really rigorous, challenging texts, texts that, quite frankly, some of these would not be out of place in an AP class themselves. These are texts that are longer, more complex, oftentimes a, a pretty high lexile level. And we believe that students can choose, with teacher support, where the texts are that they can match up to where they are most appropriately. So teachers can make these choices, students can make these choices based upon their own needs. The last thing I'll say just about these slides, and we'll talk about it a little bit more uh, in a second, is right in the middle you'll see that there's also what we call conversation of texts. These are shorter texts all around really interesting topics that, that we think that students will find to be interesting. And we'll talk more specifically about these because they really come from essential questions in here. And then the text types. Uh, Tracy, do you want to talk a little bit about the text types that are found? This is a page from uh, the 10th grade book. Yeah, certainly. Um, so from the 10th grade book, you can see that the chapters follow that whole notion of the the essential questions. And this particular chapter deals with identity and society. And you can see some of the questions that just kind of prompt student thinking um, to get into the learning for the chapter. What does identity mean? How is one identity and one's identity formed? How do personal experiences affect our identity? And then the chapters are laid out with a central text 
that just kind of explores these essential questions, uh, but kind of gives everybody a base, a place to start uh, with those essential questions. And then after the central text, you can see that we've broken out the essential questions into two different conversations with, with a, a slightly different scope or a slightly different lens, if you will. So the first conversation in this chapter still, de still deals with identity and society, but now we kind of structure it in the sense of changes and transformation. And within that conversation, you can see the list of texts that we've included include a variety of authors as well as a variety of text types because we want students to see that authors express themselves in different ways all dealing with the same idea the same concept the same issues or, or discussions but through different means and genres of, of writing about it and then the second conversation extends the idea of identity and society but now we've sort of narrowed it down to the students' lived experiences and where we talk about the individual in school. And all of the text selections in this chapter really deal with the effects of school on the individual. And we know that our, ninth, our 10th graders, we know that they can say a lot about that. Um, I'm sure they're full of opinions, as are some of the texts here that are included in the conversation. But it just... It just helps them uh, uh, look at navigating the way through academic expectations and societal higher, hierarchies and, and, and the question of where am I in all of this? And that's where that whole notion from, um, uh, from Billings and from um, uh, Escudero, that's where that notion of the windows and the mirrors can really be, uh, really be brought into the classroom. And then part of my favorite aspect of these chapters are those, those reading and writing workshops. Um, if you'll go back one slide real quick, I just want to point out that at the bottom, at the end of the chapters, we have the reading workshop, which allows students to analyze points of view or to look at uh, perspectives, because perspective matters. And then the writing workshop, the second one, is where they themselves get to write a narrative, talking about um, their own perspective, practicing that genre. Yeah, let me just ju jump in real qu quick here and say that in those two conversations, the first conversation is primarily literary text. And so that's more leaning toward the AP Lit exam. The second conversation is almost entirely nonfiction. Not entirely. We have a graphic novel in that one, for example, but the rest are nonfiction. So it's more language leaning. And the questions that we have are, are also reflective of that as well. Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. And then we have visual texts as well. Um, you know, we, sometimes we have to uh, emphasize to our students that images are text in and of themselves, and then we take them through the process of how to analyze a vis visual text, still connected to um, the, you know, the main topic, the main essential questions, uh, but it does take time to point out um, those aspects, those uh, characteristics of a visual text so that they get better at um, really emphasizing its points. And then another thing I really love is the kind of the synthesis across and within the texts themselves. So you have a, a story, is it immoral to watch the Super Bowl? And you have this little bit of a this argument on, um, you know, this analysis of, of why we're so attracted to the violence. <laughs> and then we cross that with uh, images and text, visual text that um, help students explore it from different genres. So we have the painting, and we have the warning sticker from the helmets, and then we have a, a table that shows a bar diagram that shows um, how many con concussions uh, per games and practices that are, are being recorded. So it really just extends the ideas and, and the um, conversations beyond the text itself and brings in a multitude of ways to explore. Thank you. Renee, do you want to talk a little bit about how our question types are intended to sort of create and support context and connection? 
I will be happy to do that, and then, um, but I'm going to hurry a little bit because I want to make sure we have time for a few questions. Well, part of what we, John talked about earlier was that we have these conversations embedded in it. This is in the in the ninth grade book, so that we have a main text in this one by Julia Alvarez, and then we have um, questions on that text. Um, as we do for every text in the book, on um, three levels. Understanding and interpreting just what it says, just to get the students into the content of it, ask them questions about comprehension to a certain extent, and then also moving toward interpretation. From there, we go into uh, what you don't see there is, is analyzing language style and structure. So we're going into the specifics of craft there. What choices has the writer made, whether the writer's a poet or a graphic novelist or a, um, a, a journalist writing an op-ed piece? What choices does, what's available to the writer? What choices has the writer made? And then we have topics for composing. And in those topics for composing, we have a lot of different kinds of topics. The analysis and, and, uh, the analysis and argument questions probably are leading toward the sort of thing an AP would ask. But then we also have questions, some involving research, some involve personal connections. So the students can also um, engage with the text in ways that move out from it. Now this is the conversation that John was talking about. And if there's a, a central text here in this particular one, what's the relationship between language and power, and then we have this conversation saying, you know, okay, let's look at um, let's let's look at at a variety of texts that are about on this same topic. I won't go into the ones here, but you can see a variety of, of authors. And then there are three different types of prompts here, and those also are differentiated. And they move from the first prompt, which is describe a time when your language, so it's a more personal one. How did you connect? You know, this is really, um, you know, text to self. And the second one, what steps should be taken by society to, to ensure there are not significant differences? So, you know, again, moving more into the world. And then the third one is the more abstract one. Language is a significant part of culture. How does the change in language affect one's relationship to one's culture? Again, the teacher might decide, I would like to start with this prompt, or this group of students will explore this one, and this one will do another. Or the students themselves can choose. And I like the number of John's stories he talked about when he was developing some of these materials, how he would try them out in the classroom and find that the students would, uh, the students that he to often would surprise him by choosing a very difficult prompt or very difficult text. So again, a lot of choice is built in here. We wouldn't expect every, um, every tech, uh, a teacher to read every text or assign every text, but perhaps focusing on a select group and then letting the students move into the things that are more interesting to them. Which really leads yeah, perfectly yeah. Into, into this notion of essential questions, recognizing that students themselves will engage with things that matter to them. So here are just a few sample essential questions for grade 9, and just a, a few here for grade 10. In each case, you can see that these questions are designed to allow for students' own lived experiences to be brought into the classroom in meaningful and real ways, not just as engagement level, but as genuine study and worthy of time and, and thought and effort. Zaretta Hammond, uh, that we've been talking about throughout, uh, has sort of three general suggestions when she's saying about any kind of lesson, what, what can you do to make it a little bit more culturally responsive? She talks about making it uh, gamify it, storify it, and she also talks about making it social. And we believe strongly in this as well, so much so that each of the books has multiple opportunities for speaking, listening, collaborative discussion, in some cases giving them specific direct instruction on how do we listen. What does that look like? How do we hold academic conversations that aren't just debates and yelling at each other? And how do we try to challenge each other's ideas for the purpose of maybe trying to reach consensus? And then each one of our texts has prompts and, and opportunities for discussion, for presentations, for Socratic seminars. The idea of making sure that our classrooms that are culturally responsive are opportunities for multiple student voices and multiple student perspectives. Because we're right John, here I'm just, 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to jump in before you come to the end. It's just back to that slide. And one of the things that, that we are very aware of, back to the course, not the exam, is that on the exam, at this point yet, the students don't have the opportunity to work with technology in any meaningful ways, at least not in the English ones. But they do in the courses. And so many of our topics are not responding in essays, it, not just presentations, but also multimedia things. Students are you know, given the opportunity to do podcasts and videos and, and to connect them to their readings and to their own lived experiences. I just had to make a play, um, a, a point of that, John, because I, I do Absolutely. think it's a, a real advantage. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And obviously, it, it's absurd for us to try to do something called culturally responsive teaching in an hour and a webinar in an afternoon. But I do want to end with where we started, which is with this notion of equity. And I think that if we are not recognizing that we need to put in all of the preparation in the ninth and 10th grade to be sure that all of our students have the same access and opportunity of preparation, then we're not going to do these um, things that we said early on where we won't be able to close any kind of opportunity gap for our students. So obviously we don't have uh, much or any time left for questions, but there are emails um, and we definitely ask for anyone to uh, reach out and, um, and ask us any further questions. And I think that we're recording this, uh, so if there are other questions that we want to address now, we can certainly do that. Um, but Tiffany, I'll let you take us uh, take us out. All right, awesome. We actually did get some quick questions. If you guys want to answer them now, or if you want to answer them via email, um, what do you guys prefer? I'm, I'm happy to answer them now if we can. Yeah, sure. Certainly. Of um, so going back to um, equity and pre-AP, um, I know that you guys always say that we should be challenging our students, um, whether they are pre-AP honors or on level, um, but do you have any general suggestions on how to fill major gaps? Um, like how do you fill those successfully while maintaining rigor so that all students are equally prepared? Ooh, not a softball question there to start out of the game. <laughs> it's definitely a, a tricky question, and I know that I've worked with English teams uh, of teachers on it before. And I, one story that comes to mind very quickly is we had a student who was in and out of jail, and um, he could not write a sentence. And the, the teachers came to me panicked because they were so worried that he was not going to pass the state assessment. And I remember the conversation we had where I said, no, he probably won't pass the state assessment, but we owe him um, how to write a sentence. We've got to teach him how to write a sentence. He needs to be able to write a sentence. After he knows how to write a sentence, we then string those sentences into paragraphs. So his learning looks very different than the other students learning in the classroom. And that is, that is I, the advice I give teachers is that every student has a different beginning and ending point. And we need to know where those are. And we have to be realistic with the expectations and the improvements that we expect our students to do and what is feasible. Sometimes the improvement isn't there because they've not had access and guidance. Um, sometimes it's not there because of situations students have experienced. But I don't know if John or Renee want to add to that, but I, I think that um, all students deserve those next levels of learning, whatever that may be or whatever that may look like. I, I, I would say that anybody, who, well, anybody who has been in the classroom for more than five years, talk to somebody who uh, was your student and ask them what they are, yeah, just get them in conversation about what they remember. I'm always amazed when I hear from students, and I, I haven't heard them from a while, and then they'll say, you know, what we did in your class, blah, 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 I followed through with that, and they don't say I followed through, but they'll tell me something that they picked up on that mattered to them in another context, and that is always my clue to what's working and what's not. And I say clue because, you know, it's not, it's not going to show up in data. It's not going to show up in a score. But it will show right. up in that mm -hmm. engagement help them so that they pursued something on their own. That's, I yes. know, not how to
Yeah, I can't yeah, add any fun. more than, than what you all said, other than the, the probably the most important thing that, that I think we're trying to communicate here tonight is to be culturally responsive means that you are responsive to your individual students' needs as they present themselves, which means in mm -hmm. some cases um, recognizing that the feedback you're giving to one student is going to be far different than the feedback to the other student. But as Tracy said, all of our students, 100% of them, are on a trajectory of growth. And it's our job to make sure we can identify what it is that they need to make whatever incremental changes that they're, improvements that they're going to make. But certainly ain't easy. John, That's yeah, and John, you're modest here. One of my favorite stories from John is that one of his students commented that after taking this course where he was doing a lot of nonfiction reading, that the kid was talking about the fact that he had very different conversations with his parents as a result. Now, how more culturally responsive can you be than to actually right. be in a situation where you're having a conversation with your parents? Again, I don't know exactly how that transfers to test scores, but I can say that that was a significant change in that young man's life. But whoever asked the question, if you want more information, please, please email us and we'll continue the conversation. Anything else, Kip? Yep. Um, you got a quick thank you, Renee, from Carol Jago for mentioning her article. Um, oh. and <laughs> Hi, Carol. <laughs> um, and there was one more question, um, circling back to when we were discussing text selections and foundations of language and literature. Um, if you're teaching and allowing student choice when it comes to choosing sections, um, does each section basically teach the same thing? Yeah, great question. And yeah, when I'm when I'm talking, I'll just slide back to this particular slide so we can we can talk about it. The that's the answer is absolutely yes. And in fact, I just want to describe sort of the way that this worked in my classroom last year. Uh, I was working in the narrative chapter over on the the right side of your screen there, and we as a class all did by any other name uh, by Santa Rao. And we also all did as a class La Gungita. So we had two texts sort of as a, as a touch point for how we read and understand narrative and how we can write about it. And then I did. I let them choose wherever they wanted to go based upon topic that they were interested in, level. As Renee said, I had some students who I thought no way would they go into Section 3. And yet because it, in one case it's uh, uh, by Murakami, the piece in there is about running, had kids who just want to read about running in that way. So they chose something that was significantly more challenging than I thought that their, their level was currently at. And the, the important point is that in this particular chapter, they're all looking at the exact same things. They're looking at how do we tell our stories through characterization, through indirect, direct conversation? How, do we, uh, how can we determine the theme? How can we look at uh, narrative voice? Regardless of the level of text that they chose, the assessment was identical for me. So the uh, rubric that I used, the assignment I used, everything was the same. The differentiation came in what they chose to um, to read. Yeah, and those are the essential elements at the top are basically the skills that are going to be threaded throughout every section. In the as a lot often in the questions we're asking. So that's a, that's a good question. Thank you. Great. Awesome. And all I'll just make sure that our emails are here at the end. Um, and again, uh, just reach out to us if there are further questions or comments. Yep. Thank you again for coming. Yes, thank you to everyone who's still here and who attended. And a huge thank you to you, Renee, John, and Tracy for planning this webinar with us. And thank um, you, Tiffany. <laughs> of course. Thank you all. Good night. Good night. Good night.